Hey everybody, welcome back to the fourth and the final week of a series called What Would Jesus Undo? In each and every week of this series, we have started by saying that in order for us to do what God has put us on the coast to do, there may be some things that he needs to undo in us first. That was certainly the case with Peter. Peter had some racist tendencies earlier on in his life, and in order for him to do what God had put him in the world to do, God had to undo some things in his life. And if it was true for Peter, it's probably true for us as well. The problem with that idea is that when you look at the current condition of our world and all the problems that are going on in the world around us, you think to yourself, man, it's great that Jesus wants to undo some things in me. But I'm not the one who's creating all the problems in the world. You think it's great that Jesus wants to undo some things in my heart or in my mind, but I'm not the one with my knee on another man's neck until he dies. Or maybe you think to yourself, it's great that Jesus wants to undo some things in my life, but I'm not the one who's protesting or rioting in the city streets. I'm not the one who's burning down buildings or setting police cars on fire. Like, I'm not the problem here. And that's true. You're not. But each and every single one of us understand right now just how broken our world really is. And the question that we have to answer before we wrap this series up is, what is the solution to all the problems that we see in our world? What is the solution to the racial tension that exists between the black community and law enforcement in this country? What is the solution that will help us move beyond all that we're experiencing, the frustration that people are feeling? What is the solution when you look at people who are occupying entire city blocks in the street? What, what is the answer to all of that? Because when all of us feel brokenness in our lives, we have a tendency to look to someone or something to fix what is broken. And what you choose to fix it will ultimately de determine whether or not it makes the problem better or does it make the problem worse. You see me show you this graphic all the time. I talk about how when our world is broken, there are always people who are proposing solutions that will somehow fix the problem in our lives. And yet when we choose any solution other than Jesus, ultimately what those solutions do is they lead us further away from God and they lead us further away from God's design for our lives and for our world. And I believe that if you look hard at our world right now, you'll see that that's happening almost every single day. Yes, we recognize the brokenness and the tension in our world, but the question is, what is the right solution to solve it? So some people feel the need for racial reconciliation, and they take a knee during the national anthem. Do you remember Colin Kaepernick? Man, that seems like forever ago. But in some ways, he was a man who saw that there was a need for some kind of change, and his solution was to take a knee to create awareness. Uh, other people see the problems in our world, and they think that the answer is not taking a knee during the national anthem, but it's attending a peaceful protest. Some people think that the solution is to maybe burn police cars or torch buildings or attack officers in an attempt to get the attention of the man in charge. Some people think that the solution is to take over entire city blocks. Some people think that the solution is to dismantle or defund police forces all across the country. Some people think that the solution is to impeach the current president. Some people think we should vote in a new president in November. Some people think we should empower our current president, that that will fix the problem. And as you consider all of the solutions that are being proposed in our world right now, I want you to think long and hard about whether or not those proposed solutions will make things better or could they actually make things worse? Will they lead us back to God and God's design for our lives and for our world? Or will these solutions lead us further away from God, His design for our lives and for our world? 
A few weeks ago, I heard a news report on Black Lives Matter, and in the report, they said that this movement is now the most popular political movement in the entire country. Right now, they have an approval rating of about 70%, which is a far greater approval rating than the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And while I would always say that black lives matter, listen, I'm not even in the all lives matter camp. I am completely comfortable simply and only saying that black lives matter. And while I'm comfortable saying that black lives matter, as a Christian, I cannot support the movement black lives matter. I'm not talking about the idea. I'm talking about the movement. And I need you to hear me say this. When I look at the organization Black Lives Matter, I appreciate their concern for the black community. And I appreciate the work that they are putting in to improving the black community. But at the same time, I also believe that they are proposing solutions that will actually take us further away from God. I believe that they're proposing solutions that will actually take us further away from God's design for our lives, for our families, and for our world. And because of that, it may be a very popular movement, but because of that, it could also be a very dangerous movement. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take 10 minutes out of your life. I want you to hop onto their very own website. I want you to click on the About tab, and I want you to read what they believe. See, I don't want to put words into their mouth for them. I want them to be able to speak for themselves. And if you'll read their webpage, I think what you will discover is that these are people who are using the tragedy of African American men dying in the streets to advance a cause that has very little to do with African American men dying in the streets. And so what do you do? What do you do when you're living in a world that is messed up? What are you supposed to do when you're living in a world that really does need change? Do you just keep telling everyone about Jesus until everyone on the planet is a Christian and Jesus has changed every single one of our racist hearts? Yes, you do that, (laughs) but we can do even more than that as well. In fact, Peter, this guy that we have been studying for the last three weeks, he writes a lot in the New Testament about how we should conduct ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ in what often feels like a very broken world. What we have seen in Peter throughout this series is that Peter himself, he had some racist tendencies, but God changed him. Then God used Peter to actually change the church. And now what you're going to see is that God wants to use Peter to actually change the world around him. And so today what I want to do is I want to take a quick break from our study in the book of Acts. And I want to listen to what Peter has to say himself about the issue. And I want to look together in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, because what Peter says about changing a world that needs to change is not at all what you think he would say. This is how he writes. He says, starting in verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is by God's will that by doing good, you should silence the talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. We live in a world that is broken. And I want you to hear me say that today. I'm not arguing that things are the way they're supposed to be. 
I don't believe that we should look at the problems in our world right now and just accept it and then submit to the governing authorities in our world. In fact, the entire premise of this message revolves around the idea that things are wrong in our world. The question is, how are we supposed to conduct ourselves as Christians in that kind of world? Peter is a man who has all kinds of experience with this. God's already changed him. God has used him to change the church, and now God is using him to help bring about change in the world. And when Peter begins, Peter begins by saying that we should submit to those in authority, and we should honor those who are in authority. Now, That's a tough pill for some of us to swallow. But I promise you this, that would have been an even tougher pill for a man like Peter to swallow. See, in these verses, he talks both about the emperor and the governors. The emperor in his day was a man named Nero. He lived at a time in history where there was a transition in power from Claudius to Nero. And Nero was a very bad man. And it's not just that Nero was a bad man, but he was a man who hated men like Peter. He couldn't stand Christians. And so Nero, history tells us, would often tie ropes around the arms and the legs of Christian men and women. And then he would tie those ropes off to four horses that would be pulling in four different directions. And for fun... Nero would whip the horses to see if the horses had the power to dismember Christian men and Christian women. Nero was the kind of guy who would host gladiator games. And for sport, he would take Christians and he would throw them into the arena with wild animals just to watch these Christians try to fight for their lives. This guy, Nero, was a guy who would hold state parties at his palace in the nighttime. And to provide light for all of his guests, he would soak Christians in resin and then he would light them on fire. In fact, history tells us that eventually Peter is martyred under the leadership of Nero. Peter. The guy who is writing and telling the world that they need to honor the emperor and they need to submit to the emperor. He's actually murdered by his emperor. And honestly, the governors that Peter is writing about, they weren't that much better themselves. In fact, there were a couple of governors that Peter would have been familiar with throughout his lifetime. One was a guy named Pontius Pilate. And the other was a guy named Felix. Now, Pontius Pilate was the governor who, according to the New Testament, handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now, if you remember that scene, the governor in the New Testament is partnering with the chief priest of the New Testament. And they want to arrest Jesus. So the governor deploys troops. And the troops come to arrest Jesus. And Peter, in that moment, he's not about submitting to or honoring the authority. Instead, you know what he does? He pulls out his sword and he tries to cut the head off of a soldier. He misses and he cuts the guy's ear off. What you see in Peter at that time in his life is a man who is willing to fight for the cause. You see in Peter a man who is ready to fight to establish a new kingdom and give his world a new leader in a man named Jesus. But in that moment, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, put your sword away. That's not how we handle this. And Jesus chose to submit to and to honor the authority in Pontius Pilate, a man who would hand him over to be crucified. The other governor that he would have been familiar with in his lifetime was a guy named Felix. Felix was a governor who persecuted one of his closest friends, a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And yet, here Peter is, with these men in mind, thinking about people like Claudius, Nero, 
Pontius Pilate, and even Felix. And he says, our job as followers of Jesus Christ who are living in a broken world under a broken system is to submit to and to honor the authority that is in place. So listen, regardless of what you think about political leadership in this community, in this state, or in this country, I promise you this, we have it way better than Peter had it when he was writing these words. And yet Peter, he started the passage by saying we should submit to those in authority and he ended the passage by saying we should honor those in authority. I believe that includes, but it is not limited to, the President of the United States of America, our governor, senators, others who are in power in Jackson, our own mayor, I believe that when you look at that scene between Jesus and Peter, as Jesus is being arrested, that would also include law enforcement, even our school superintendent. Now, I want you to think about the way in which you feel about and the way that you think about authority for just a minute. We know how Peter thinks and we know what Peter believes, but I want you to compare that to what you think. So here's my question for you. How do you think we should act toward people in authority? especially people who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or people like Nero, who may have even been the problem in the first place. Now, let me ask you one more question. Do your thoughts and feelings change based on who is elected as president of this country in the election later this year in November? And the reason that I ask that is because I think a lot of us think about authority based on who is in authority. And yet scripture seems to teach us what kinds of citizens we're supposed to be. And it's not dependent upon what kind of leader we have. Now, Peter doesn't say you have to vote for the one who's in authority. (laughs) Peter doesn't say you have to agree with the one who's in authority. But Peter does say, That as followers of Jesus Christ, you have to submit to the one who's in authority and you have to honor those who are in authority. And yet for most of us, that's difficult because the way that we feel about those in authority is completely dependent upon how they do their job or whether or not we agree with them. And so think about it like this. When you are the one who's in authority, you always believe that people should honor you and submit to you. You feel that way when you're in authority in your home. You feel that way in the workplace. You feel that way in the community. But when you are under someone else's authority and you don't agree with them or you don't see things the way that they see them, all of a sudden I think most of us feel empowered and entitled to rebel against that authority. And that is especially true in America. Every culture in the world has a default setting in the way that they think about authority figures. Every culture falls into one of two categories. We either have a default setting that says we're going to respect authority or we rebel against authority. So there are some cultures in the world and they respect authority regardless of who's in authority. They respect authority regardless of how corrupt that authority may be. But there are other cultures in the world that have a default setting and they rebel against authority. So let me ask you, which default setting do we have in America? Do we respect authority or do we default toward rebelling against authority? You know the answer. We rebel. And it's been that way from the very beginning of this country. In fact, the whole country got started by rebelling against the authority of Britain. And so when we earned our freedom through fighting and through war, what did we do? We celebrate on a day called Independence Day. We're celebrating our independence from the authority in Britain. And we celebrate our independence by blowing things up. It's what we do because we are rebels. In fact, a couple of months ago, my family and I, we were sitting around the television and we were actually watching some of the very depressing riots that were taking place in city streets across America. 
And as I watched the TV, I asked my two kids, I said, kids, do you see anyone participating in the riots that is over the age of 30 years old? And so we watched for quite a while, and never once did we see anyone who looked or appeared to be over the age of 30 years old. And so finally, my kids said to me, well, Dad, the the reason that there are no older people participating in the riots is because if the old people in that city are anything like you, then they have to go to bed before the riots begin, okay? (laughs) And so we were able to joke back and forth a little bit and banter with one another, But then I later heard a young lady in our church say something that's not so funny as much as it is startling. She said in response to young people rioting in the streets, she said, what do you expect from a generation that grew up on movies like Divergent, The Hunger Games, X-Men Apocalypse, or even The Maze Runner? Now, if you're not familiar with these movies, these movies, they do not end until those in authority have been overthrown. And so this is what our culture teaches us. When you disagree with those who are in authority, this is how you handle it. You rebel and you riot until they are overthrown. And so I just have to ask you, in response to the reality that we see in the world, who is influencing you? Who's teaching you how you're supposed to respond to authority figures that you don't agree with? Is it Hollywood? Is it your favorite musician or your favorite sports star who's really vocal about their political views? Is it someone else? Is it a professor at the university? Is it someone on social media? Is it popular television? Are you being influenced more by CNN or maybe Fox News? Or is it Jesus? Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ has a lot to say even about this area of your life. And our job is to let him influence the way we think and influence the way we behave. And so all throughout scripture, scripture teaches that when you have a problem with those in authority, you submit to and you honor those who are in authority, but then you can always appeal to an even higher authority. And so let me give you just a couple of examples of this in scripture. Next week, we're going to go right back to our study in the book of Acts, and we'll be in Acts chapter 12. And when we're reading Acts chapter 12 next week, you're going to see that Peter is in jail, and wrongly so. And so the question becomes, how how do the people who are under Peter's leadership respond to something that is wrong, like, like their leader being put in jail for an unjust cause? What do they do? Do they protest in the city streets? Do they riot out throughout the community? Do they go out and march outside of the emperor's home? Do they try to break him out of jail? No, they don't do any of that. They pray. And by praying, they appeal to the highest authority in the cosmos. And guess what? It worked. Because what you'll see next week is that the day before his trial, and probably the day before he would have been executed, Peter is miraculously delivered out of prison and he is saved from death. Let me give you another example of how this works in Scripture. I'll take you back to the Old Testament, a place and an example that was often used by Dr. Martin Luther King as he led the civil rights movement. One of the things that he would always do is he would take the people who were suffering in this country and he would help them find identity in what was happening in Old Testament Israel as they lived in slavery in Egypt. So let's use that example. Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. This is what we read about those people. It says this. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, 
He said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will even become more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So at least according to Exodus chapter 1, the number of people who were part of this slave nation called Israel, it had grown to be so large that there was a very real possibility that they could overthrow the powers at B. And this new king who came into power in Egypt was looking at the reality of the world that he was getting ready to lead, and he was very concerned. So my question is, well, what did Israel do? Did they protest? Did they take the country by force? No. Instead of rebelling against the authority, they submitted to the authority, and then they appealed to an even higher authority. Very next chapter, Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, it says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. The Israelites appealed to the highest authority in the entire cosmos, God himself. And God looked down on them and he was concerned about them. And then in the very next chapter, God speaks to Moses through a burning bush. And in that moment, he ignites the process of delivering Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They appealed to the higher authority and it worked. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus... Let me say this, I understand why you protest, but I want to make sure that you understand why you protest. You protest because you don't believe in the power of prayer. So when you're living in a broken world, when you're living under a broken system, then what you end up doing is you start looking for all kinds of options and if you don't believe in God or you don't have a relationship with God, then prayer is not an option for you. And because you don't believe that God will come through for you, you feel like you've got to take matters into your own hands. And so maybe you do take a knee during the national anthem. But if that doesn't work, maybe you go to a peaceful protest. Or maybe you even organize one. And if that doesn't work, then maybe you escalate things and you say, you know what, we're going to have to do a little bit more in, in order to get the attention of people in charge. So maybe you riot or you loot. Maybe you take over entire city blocks. But inevitably, these attempts to solve the problem, they do not bring humanity together. They only tear humanity apart. These solutions don't really fix the problem because a lot of the people who are promoting these solutions, they're not fighting for equality. They're fighting for power. And they're only taking us further away from God. And they're only taking us further away from God's design for our lives, for our families, and for our world. And so if you're still listening to me after everything that we've said in a four-part series on race, I want you to know that when there is a problem, Mosaic Church will always be for you because Jesus is for you. Jesus Christ loves you and cares about you and is concerned about you so much that he was willing to lay down his life for you. And because Jesus loves you in that kind of way, we will always be a church that loves you in that kind of way. And so what I'm saying to you is that we will be with you to appeal to the higher authority. And I want you to see what that looks like. 
It means that we will get on our knees and we will pray with you and for you when you are being treated in a way that shows racism and lacks love. But I want you to know we're willing to do more than that. Here at Mosaic, we're even willing to leverage any and every relationship that we have to use the right process and the right people to bring about change that is needed in our world. But if we get involved, you need to know, we will always submit to and honor the authority in this world while we appeal to an even greater authority in this world. And the reason that we're going to do that is because that's what God requires of us, and that is what works best. It's what works best to bring about change in the world, and it's what works best to preserve our reputation as followers of Jesus Christ. And so you want to talk about what is the the right way to bring about real change in our world? Just look at our own state and and you'll find a perfect example. Recently, a a major change took place in the state of Mississippi. Now, I, I don't know how you feel about that change, but honestly, that's not even the issue. On Tuesday, June 30th, Governor Tate Reeves signed a bill to retire the Mississippi state flag of 1894. Now, regardless of how you feel about that decision, I want you to understand the process that led to that outcome. And so what I did is I wrote to one of my friends, a man in our church named Jeremy England, who is a state senator. And I said, Jeremy, tell me about the process that you got to see with your own eyes that led to this change in our state. And so he wrote me a very lengthy explanation. I'm going to read the last two paragraphs to you. This is what he said. He said, most importantly, this change was made peacefully using the legislative process. There were no large protests. No buildings were burned. No police in riot gear were ever deployed. Not a single canister of tear gas was fired. The legislative process worked and prayers were answered. Looking back at the many difficulties faced to overcome this issue that divided Mississippians for over a century, it is easy to see God's hand at work. A legislative body acted in a bipartisan manner to accomplish a huge feat And it did so despite the most politically divisive climate in recent memory and in the middle of a global pandemic. Just like the book of Acts, where God used experiences and new lessons to change the heart and mind of Peter so that he would spread the gospel to people outside of Judea, he used the events and circumstances of the tumultuous year of 2020 to change the hearts and minds in the Mississippi state capital. For this, we owe him, God, many thanks. And we owe it to ourselves to remember how he played a role in putting Mississippi in a better place. Moving forward, our prayers should never cease for thanks and for God to continue to help move this great state of Mississippi forward. May we lead through Him and by Him to make our country and our world a better place. Now, regardless of how you feel about that decision. I hope that you can see the value in that process. The process works. And so we do exactly what Peter tells us to do in this text. We submit to human authority. We do what is right and good. We live our lives as slaves to God, no one else. We show proper respect to everyone, even those we disagree with. We love our Christian brothers and sisters. We fear God and we honor the emperor. And because of the way in which we conduct our lives, we earn a reputation and we earn the right to be heard. And our influence with leadership grows. And so does the possibility that we could bring about real change in our world. 
If you look at our world right now, there are many different groups that are offering many different solutions. Some of those solutions will make the problem even worse. But the ways of Jesus will always make our world far better. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for what your word teaches us in the middle of very difficult days. God, I pray for the people of Mosaic Church. I pray, God, that we would be a light in a world that feels very dark. I pray, God, that we would always see people and treat people as though they are equals. I pray, God, that we would be willing to practice forgiveness even when it's hard. And finally, God, I pray that we would always understand that there is a way, a better way to bring about change in our world. That we submit to and we honor those in authority while appealing to an even higher authority. God, we end this series by praying for our nation and we ask, God, that you would bring about peace to our land, that you would be gracious and merciful to America, and that you would bring about healing to a nation that really needs it. God, we invite you to do your work. Start with your church, but God, be merciful to this country. And we ask it all in the great name of Jesus. Amen.